you're opening your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 33, we continue our journey through the book of Jeremiah, looking at highlights and themes that uh, Jeremiah wants to promote to the people of Judah as they uh, get ready to go into captivity from Babylon and uh, eventually as they're in captivity. Um, this book has a lot to say to us because uh, we're a lot, have strayed a lot from the God of the universe, much like the people of Judah have strayed. I think this time that he's writing is probably a little earlier, about 15 years earlier than chapters 31 and 32, probably somewhere around 605 BC. Jeremiah is not concerned to go chronologically. He more wants to communicate themes, and so he writes in sections of themes that will present certain ideas that he wants the people of Judah to, to uh, understand. And so this was written somewhere around 605 BC during the first siege of Babylon for, uh, against Jerusalem. I don't know how much you know about sieges, but they're not a pleasant place to be if you're the, inside the city um, that's under siege. Uh, you're not able to come and go. Uh, you're pretty much surrounded, and whatever resources you have available, that's it. Um, in the Bible itself, it records instances where people in Jerusalem were eating their own children because there was no food. In fact, Jeremiah in this passage is going to talk about how there's no animals available because they've all been eaten. Um, water was a premium uh, when they were under siege, and Hezekiah actually had the insight in order to build a tunnel to be able to get water uh, at a pretty consistent basis. But you were trapped. Um, and Jeremiah is speaking to the people of, of uh, Judah as they're trapped in Jerusalem, telling them, Right now, you don't, it doesn't look like there's any hope at all. In fact, it looks entirely hopeless. But with the God of the universe, you have a bright and glorious future. You just have to wait 70 years to enjoy it. About the uh, length of most of our lifetimes or a little longer. Which has perked my thinking that aging is a lot like being under siege. I'm 65, and my body doesn't have the freedom to come and go anymore. I told the first service, and it's true, up until about age 35, 38, I could go out any time, any day of the week, and run a six-minute mile or less just at a whim. I didn't have to train for it. I didn't have to do anything about it. I was just in that good a shape. I had run cross-country in high school and college, uh, ran a marathon late in college, uh, Kept running here and there, different things, up until about age 35, and I blew out my knee, and then uh, that, kiss goodbye to that kind of thing. My eyes are going bad. Um, I, I get weaker. I, I, I only can move about uh, 20 pavers that are 40 pounds apiece, and I got to sit down and take a break. Used to be I could load bales of straw up into a haymow endlessly. We'd do 10,000 a week. Um, in 120 degree temperatures up in the, uh, in, the, in the mile that I was a farmer's boy. Those days are long gone. And I feel like I'm under siege. That I don't have the resources available to any, anymore. I can't do what I want to do anymore. Um, my future looks bleak if I keep my perspective in this world only. And the God of the universe and Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John have all told us, don't do that. In this world, Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. You need to keep your hope and your perspective outside of this world. Otherwise, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because right now, you're under siege. In verse 3, he says this, call to me and I will answer you, tell and and then tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. And that's exactly what, the, um, what Jeremiah is doing for the people of Judah, telling them what a great future they have if they hold on to their faith in God. In verses 14 and following, there's all sorts of eschatological um, information that is given. Um, eschatology has to do with the, the study of end times, the, the last days. Um, the second coming of Christ is, would be part of that. Um, the rapture, if you believe in that, would be part of that. Um, you need to know, um, I studied eschatology 
very, very seriously from about 1981 to 1983. I started a six-week Sunday school class. It ended up going by like a year and a half because I just got so immersed in the books of Ezekiel and uh, Zechariah and the book of Revelation and all the prophecies that are in Jeremiah and Isaiah and Micah and uh, Amos. And I just got so immersed that just, it just exploded on me in the Sunday school. And I mercifully uh, ended the Sunday school after 18 months and the class cheered. And um, I just couldn't help myself. I got overwhelmed with how much evidence there is in the promises of God for a second coming, a new heaven and new earth, and a new life under heaven, a new me. And I just got immersed in it. But I learned an important lesson. And as a result, I became a pan millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end. Here's what I discovered in looking at, you know, pre-trib, post-trib, pre-millennial, post-millennial, all those kind of things. Um, I, I read all the opposing views and I was convinced of every one of them. Listen, folks, I don't know how much you've read on different views of eschatology, but they can all make a really good case from Scripture. But the one thing I learned is this. There were a group of people at one time who absolutely were sure that they knew when Jesus, when the Messiah was coming, and they had their charts and their timelines and everything all mapped out, and they missed Jesus. They were called the Pharisees and the teachers of the people and the elders of the law. And folks, when I realized that I was listening to people with their charts and graphs and timelines and everything else, and that I was starting to formulate in my mind what the Messiah was going to look like and what he had to do before he came back, I realized I had fallen into the same trap the, the Pharisees fell into, and they missed Jesus because they had in their mind what he was supposed to look like, and Jesus, when he came, didn't look like that. Here's what I've learned since, and that's why I'm going to treat this particular passage in eschatology. That's why I don't spend a whole lot of time preaching out of Zechariah and Ezekiel and the book of Revelation, is that those passages are good. You can be greatly edified because we win. That's all you need to know. And I believe with all my heart, it's good to know all those other things because as God reveals them and as they happen, you'll go, I remember that. I remember God talking about that. And it'll encourage your faith and it'll help you to become stronger as you face difficult times ahead. And I believe that's exactly what Jeremiah is doing to the people of Judah. He's telling them, listen, difficult times are coming. You've got 70 years. You need to batten down the hatches long term because there's going to be events that are going to happen that make you think that you're going to be off the hook quicker. It's not going to happen. In fact, I told you a couple of weeks ago that the second siege under, uh, for Jerusalem, um, the Babylonians were, had Jerusalem locked in and the Egyptians came and so the Babylonians had to call off the siege, chase after the Egyptians, chase them back into their sort of corner of the world and come back and put them under siege the third time. And the people of Jerusalem foolishly thought, ah, Jeremiah's wrong. God didn't know what he was talking about. We're free. They weren't free. They were just off the hook for about six months. Folks, the promises of God is, in this passage is telling us are as sure as the planetary motions. And in fact, God challenges you that if you think you can disrupt the planetary motions, think about that for a minute. If you can disrupt the planetary motions, then his promises won't come true. <laughs> We were taught in physics class that if you run this way, the earth slowly grows, mows. <laughs> that they didn't tell you is in China, they got people running this way. <laughs> Sorry, the physicists and me were just. Um, it's, this particular passage is going to talk about the righteous branch of David. That became a very, very uh, technical term in the Jewish people's mindset. So much so that they started to identify the Messiah, the Christ, 
not as the Messiah and the Christ, but as the son of David, the king of the Jews. Because of these prophecies from Jeremiah 33, the one we're going to look at today from um, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, we're also going to look at that. That's not one of the ones we're going to read publicly, but it's one of the ones we're going to be looking at. Son of David, and remember, look at the book of uh, Matthew. When somebody's in need, what, remember the lepers? Remember the, the blind men? Remember the, the people that are uh, oppressed? Jesus, son of David, help me. Over and over that happens. How does, how does uh, Matthew introduce his understanding of the Christ? The Messiah, son of David. And he goes through all the liturgy in order to show that he's son of David. How do the wise men show up? How do they say, we're looking for Jesus, the king of the Jews. Where can we find him? How, how does Pilate address Jesus on the sign on the cross? This is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. All those terms are all pointing to the Messiah. And Jesus doesn't miss a trip. And he says, I'm him. Listen very, very carefully as Christy, is you doing this one? Yep, Christy Plemons is going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 10 through 26. The sermon, Lord willing, will be like the first one and not that long. And you're going, praise God. But listen very, very carefully because there's a lot of important things in here we need to talk about. Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate waste without men or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither men nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In this place, desolate and without men or animals, in all its towns, there will again be pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. In the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills of the Negev, in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, and in the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night can no longer come at their appointed time, then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, who are priests ministering before me, can be broken, and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on his throne. I will make the descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister before me, as countless as the stars of the sky, and as measureless as the sand on the seashore. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not noticed that these people are saying, the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose? So they despise my people, and no longer regard them as a nation." This is what the Lord says. If I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd encourage you to pull out the sermon outline. Um, There's not really a whole lot of quotes that I'm going to be referring to from the sermon outline, but it's always helpful, at least in my mind, to fill out the blanks and follow along because it uh, makes it easier to know where I'm at. I don't know if you picked up it or not, but Jeremiah is referring referring to the promise that was given to to, uh, David way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
the, Jeremiah is speaking somewhere around 605 B.C. at this particular time. The promise to David was given somewhere around 1000 B.C. This is almost 400 years later. They still haven't enjoyed what, what God promised to David. Listen, remember from, from what uh, Michael read to you. Verse 10, he says, um, these, Your people can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Folks, there's no more disturbed people than the Jewish people. If you look over the last 4,000 years of recorded earthly history of the Jewish people, they've been constantly disturbed. He goes on to say, wicked people will not oppress them anymore. I can't think of any people more oppressed than the Jews. For goodness sake, Stalin and Hitler annihilated about 10 million of them just because they didn't want them around. This has not yet come true. It will. God is incapable of lying. And there's really, really important promises that God has made to his people that will one day come true and that is the power by which we can live now is by hoping and by trusting in those future promises. And the hope that is in the scripture is not a wishful thinking hope. It is a sure deal hope. It's not like winning the lottery, I hope I win the lottery. It's I hope I see tomorrow's sunrise. The sun will rise. Whether I'm there to see it or not, it's another deal. But the sun will rise tomorrow. Here we go. If you want to follow in the sermon outline, the question before the house is this. What future hope can God's people look forward to? I believe the answer is this. A day is coming in which all will be shalom. All will be prosperity and peace. All will be good. All will be righteous. All will be at peace. This day will correspond with the coming of the Messiah, David's righteous branch. And that's a technical term referring to Jesus, referring to the Messiah. The the root of Jesse is the same thing because Jesse is David's father. And so the root of Jesse produces the righteous branch, Jesus. All through the line of David. Day is coming which all will be shalom. This day will correspond with the coming of Messiah, David's righteous branch, because we all live under a curse. This world is cursed. We're cursed. Ever since Adam and Eve have disobeyed God, a curse has been upon this world. We can't get along anymore. We can't, you know, when the Miss America contests always say, what would you like to see? I'd like to see world peace. Yeah. Without Jesus, that's not possible. The problem is we're not at peace here. How can we expect to have peace out here when all of us are not at peace here? Folks, you can't be at peace here. Your heart and your home has to be somewhere else. You can live at peace with your heart somewhere else. But if your heart is in this world, in this world you're going to have trouble, Jesus said. But if your heart is in the next world, if your heart is in Jesus, if your heart is in the hope that we have beyond this world, then you can be overcomers and conquerors of this world. But if you're hoping, I said it in the first service and it's it's still true in the second service. (laughs) If you're looking to people to be your salvation, to be your hope, you're of all men most to be pitied. I don't care how faithful your spouse is. I don't care how faithful your children are. I don't care how faithful your employer or employees are. They will disappoint you. Just talk to my wife. I do it on a constant basis to her. I did it twice this week. And she's still married to me. And she's smiling. Love you, baby. I wish you were sitting here. (laughs) You, you all know that when I get in trouble, I look to her and she bails me out. And back there, I got to find her. And so, she's behind you, Marv, so I'm not looking to you. So. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we are, we are prone to make other people the basis of our hope, the basis of our future. The basis of our expectations. Now, in a certain sense, you need to do that. But folks, ultimately, you can't do that. 
I know that that, that child knows. <laughs> the word for the day is Messiah. Messiah alone can be trusted with our hope. Messiah alone can be trusted to make good on his promises. Okay, number one, what future hope can God's people look forward to? One, a day is coming in which all will be shalom. That's what Jeremiah is talking about. That's what God promised to David. That's what Isaiah is talking about. Look what he says. This is what the Lord says, verses 10 and 11. You say about this place, this is a desolate waste without men or animals. That's because they're under siege. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither men nor animals, there will be heard once more the sound of joy and gladness, the voices of brides and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offering to the Lord, saying, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever. You know why there wasn't thank offerings being bought, brought to the temple now? There were no animals to bring. They'd eaten them all. But... Even though there's no weddings and no celebrations and no birthday parties now because there's nothing to celebrate, all is doom and gloom, one day there will be weddings, there will be parties, there will be, will be celebrations. There'll be more than enough provision to bring thank offerings to the Lord. But most of the people that Jeremiah is talking to will not see it in this world. That's why our hope and our future has to be beyond this world. The place that Isaiah talks about it in chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah. Just listen to this. This is astounding. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse, you remember, is David's father. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. That's that righteous branch of David that Jeremiah talks about. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of, of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness to sash around his waist. He's talking about Jesus. But listen, it goes on to even more astounding promises. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra and the Young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the waters as the waters cover the earth. In that day, the root of Jesse, the righteous branch of David, the Messiah, Jesus, will stand as a banner for the peoples and nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. That's what we have to look forward to. And folks, it's not now. If little infants put their hand in a viper's nest, they can expect big time problems. If you try to put a hungry lion and a lamb together, don't expect much out of that lamb. We live in a world that still is under the curse. But one day, Jesus is going to come back and relieve us from the curse. But it won't happen until Jesus comes back and makes a new heaven, a new earth. Two, what glorious hope can uh, God's people look forward to? David's righteous branch will will usher in this future hope. Verses 15 of our text today. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. Verse 17, for this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit in the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before me continue to offer burnt offerings. Folks, I don't know if you remember from the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 5 through chapter 10, The writer of Hebrews spends a a huge amount of time trying to show us that Jesus is a superior king. Jesus is a superior priest. Jesus is a superior sacrifice. Because he knows these prophecies and he knows that Jesus is a fulfillment of them. And that one day Jesus is going to come back, not as a redeeming savior, like he did the first time, 
But he's going to come back as a conquering king. And it says in Revelation chapter 19, somewhere in the middle of that chapter, that he will rule with an iron, iron rod. Not gold, not velvet, not fleece. An iron rod. Why? Because he's going to whip this world into shape so it will go back to what it was supposed to be when he created it originally in the garden before we screwed it up. And those people who do not want Jesus to come back and do that will hate the day of the Lord. Read the scriptures. I spent three years pouring through about the day of the Lord, the end times, the second coming, uh, the return of Christ. And folks, not everybody thinks the day of the Lord is a great time. There's a lot of people who look at the day of the Lord and go, no, no, no. Because they don't want Jesus to rule. Make sure you're on the right side of that iron rod. Because he will not come up for a vote. And he will not consult any of us about what to do next. Because we're the problem. Jesus is the solution. That's why in the Christmas story, especially in Luke chapter 2, over and over, Jesus is referred to as being born in the town of David. In Bethlehem, the town of David. He's of the tribe and line of David. In the city of David, you will find a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Why does he say all those things? Because David and the son of David was a technical term in order to point to the Messiah. And what the angels were declaring on that first morning that Jesus was born was that the one that was promised to David is here. Now he's not accomplished everything yet, but he will. And that's why the Pharisees missed him the first time. That's why the teachers of the law missed him the first time. They didn't understand that there was a second coming of Christ. He thought it was going to do it all in the first one. Don't make the same mistake. Worship point. Worship the God who holds the future and whose promises are as certain as the planetary movements. Look what he says in verses 20 through uh, 21. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, night so that day and night no longer come at their appointed time, then my covenant, my my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites who are priests will be broken. Good luck trying to do that. What Jeremiah is saying here is that these covenants are sure. They are certain. Gospel application. Jesus, the Messiah, has come and lived the life necessary and died the death required to provide the capital God demands to ensure our future hope. He is the righteous branch of David. Look in the middle of the text that we read um, for today. Let me find it real quick. Um, verse 16. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. That phrase comes up a lot in the Old Testament. Why? Because it's true. If you try to obtain the Lord's righteousness on your own, you will fail miserably. First of all, you have a very low view of God and his righteousness if you think you as a human can obtain it. I believe with all my heart, if you think you can live to moral perfection, you're blaspheming God. Because you don't know, you have no idea what real moral perfection means. It means everything you do is loving and righteous and good. Every thought that comes across your mind some of you have sinned 20 times in this service. I've looked at your faces. I know. <laughs> You've looked at your watch 40 times. How much longer is this guy going to be? Oh, you're batting down the hatches. <laughs> it's like Judah. You've got to wait longer. It won't be that long. <laughs> Folks, every inclination of our heart should be righteous and pure and moral. Instead, the Bible tells us that for many of us, every inclination of our heart is towards evil. We 
we have done such a good job of lying to ourselves. And the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. We've done such a good job lying to ourselves, we can't even recognize the evil in our hearts any longer. Ask your roommate, ask your husband or wife to be honest with you about your faults. And don't criticize them when they speak honestly to you. If you don't really want to know, then don't ask. But they see it. I'm grateful to my wife. Pride's very seldom a problem with my sinfulness. And God is our righteousness. I don't know if you noticed, but you sang 2 Corinthians 5.21 um, early on in the, in the, uh, in the service. Um, God made him who had no sin to be righteousness for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Folks, I'll never forget when it really came upon me, the Lord is our righteousness and when I finally understood more comprehensively what that implied. I was at a little church called Union Church in uh, kind of in the middle between Markle, Indiana, Roanoke, Indiana, and Huntington, Indiana, out in the middle of the cornfields and I was sitting on a Wednesday night service with uh, Pastor uh, Ron Getz. And he was doing a Wednesday night study in the book of Romans. We were on Romans chapter 3. And in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, But now there is a righteousness revealed that is from God and is not, no longer based upon the law. And he quoted 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Lord, our righteousness. I was set free. Because up until that time, and this is, I was about 34 years old, up until that time, I was trying to obtain and earn and merit my own righteousness. Give it up, people! You will only become that righteous when God transforms you and gives you his heart and gives you his mind and makes you in the entirely new creation up in heaven where we'll be able to live completely free because every inclination of our heart will be towards righteousness. Every inclination of our mind will be towards that which is loving and good. Right now, we're the most selfish creatures on the planet. I don't know how you guys are, but I get done with conversations. I get done with Sunday morning services and go, God, that was stupid. What was I thinking? Why did I say that? I, all I was doing was trying to make myself look good. You ever come away from a conversation like that? I'm looking at some of you and I'm thinking, you should have. Same church. Two years later, I was on the board. I was actually the treasurer for the church. Um, God, thank you. It was only a one-year job. But I feel for Chris. He's been at it like 15, 20 years. But it was only a one-year job. And I remember sitting on the board. And a, a guy was coming to interview for us to support him as a missionary. And I thought, wow. When he got done, he thought, wow. That was kind of a nice presentation. And he left while the board talked about supporting him. And one of the board members just blistered him. And went, whoa, what's, what's going on here? He said, didn't you hear him? He used the word I at least 140 times in just a 10-minute talk. And I went, he's right. He's right. And ever since that meeting, I've become keenly aware of how I use it and how you use it. Because it really does reflect our hearts. Because what's in the heart comes out of the mouth. 
Jesus, the Messiah, has come and lived the life necessary and died the death required to provide the capital required to ensure our future hope. He is the righteous branch of David and by faith in him, he will give to us the very righteousness of God himself. Not that we've earned it, but as a gift. And in your, in your sermon outline, I verified with this gene in the first service, there should be like, like four or five different verses. Look those up. They will all say the same thing. It's a righteousness that's from God. Spiritual challenge. Live, the, uh, live in light of this future hope. Seek to know and understand the promises of God to, to his people. Don't lose in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. Some of you I know because I've talked to you and I've prayed with you and I've been around you you're going through very, very dark times. In fact, as I look out in the congregation, uh, my heart breaks for about a half dozen of you because I know the pain you're going through. The promises of God in Jesus are still true. Don't let go of them. Never, 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 to quote Churchill, Never, never, never give up. To be quite honest with you, Peter was right in John chapter 6. In reality, Jesus is all you've got anyway. Where else are you going to go? Philosophy, science, medicine, money? Don't be a joke. Jesus is the only hope we have and his promises are true. So it doesn't matter how dark it gets. It doesn't matter how hopeless your situation seems. Even if you die, I, I would like to suggest that's the greatest option of all. The Apostle Paul, writing in Romans chapter 8, uh, I'm not ready to go on to the next point, so you were trying to fill in your blanks. I watch 40 of you put your heads down to fill in the next blank. I'm not going to entertain that thought right now. <clears throat> I want to read you a portion of Romans chapter 8 that has been one of my favorite uh, ser sermon texts for a funeral. Look what the Apostle Paul says. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. It's my understanding that what the Apostle Paul is saying, look at the horrible thing <clears throat> that you've got to go through right now and how much it's dragging you down and how dark it may be. And the further down it takes you, allow that to slingshot you up to higher heights because whatever bad you have to endure, it doesn't come close to the good thing you're going to be able to enjoy in that future hope when we're redeemed. Allow your suffering, allow your pain, allow your grief to be a red flag to go up in your life and to, to realize and make you think, listen, Jesus promised, the Apostle Paul promised, the Apostle Peter promised, the Apostle John promised, the Old Testament promised that this world was not where we're going to find our hope. It has to come in that next world that will be the new heaven, the new earth, the where Jesus and the righteous branch will be able to be Lord of all and King of kings. One day Jesus will come back and make this world into the new earth into the new heaven. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. But not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Don't be discouraged by the pain and suffering. Allow the pain and suffering to be a reminder of the future promises that we have in Christ and those promises are sure and secure. So what? Now you can go to your blanks. Because of Jesus, believers can live as overcomers 
even more than conquerors in spite of the FWS. And that's a term that Buddy and I have perpetuated probably the last five years or so, somewhere like that. FWS means either fallen world syndrome or fallen world system, depending on what context you're using it in. But folks, it doesn't matter how fallen the world is, we have hope in Christ beyond this world. And that's what Jeremiah is trying to get across, and it's crucially important for us, because folks, this world is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity all, all the time. I am, I'm absolutely, listen, I've lived on this earth for 65 years. Is that right, baby? Yeah, 65 years. 55 of which I've been at least mildly aware of what's going on. Probably more the last 20 years. <laughs> but folks, I am astounded at how quickly we are abandoning Christian, Judeo-Christian values. I'm absolutely spellbound by how quickly um, the world has turned hostile towards Christian. The Western world has turned hostile towards Christianity. I mean, there's people posting on, on, on uh, Facebook now and social media of blacklisting. In fact, uh, cities are blacklisting Christians and blacklisting states that have uh, values. I, I heard this week that Franklin Graham sent out a social media post saying that, that the mayor of San Francisco is not going to allow any of his government officials go and have any type of uh, business transaction at all in 22 st states that oppose abortion. Won't deal with them. Folks, that's a, that's a hint, a glimmer of what will ultimately come for those that, that are uh, followers of God. Because the book of Revelation talks about the time where you will not be able to buy or sell if you don't take the mark of the beast and buy into the FWS. To mix metaphors. Folks, you need this message from Jeremiah. I don't so much because I really believe I'm going to be dead and gone by the time the world really sucks in and collapse. But some of you students and my grandchildren especially, I worry to death about my grandchildren because if it's collapsed so quickly in the last 20 years, what's going to happen in the next 20 years? Because in my mind, the collapse of the, of the Judeo-Christian values in the West has been exponential. It started out like this and it went boom. What's it going to be like 20 years from now? I'm praying for revival. I'm praying that God will be merciful to us. But folks, he's allowed his people to suffer before. It actually does us a lot of good because it refines us and makes us pure. If you don't believe that, just look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 9, 3 through 9. The Apostle Peter says, in fact, the, all of First and Second Peter is written to believers who are suffering persecution, telling them, you need this. Some of you are not ready for that. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. That's why we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. That's why our hope and our security has to be upon Jesus and not this world. This world will disappoint us.